Poseidon's Trident. In the Philippines, according to the Iliad, the world was divided by Lot into three. Zeus received the heavens, Hades the underworld, and Poseidon got the sea. Most likely, referring to the lands along the coasts of the rivers and the seas. One of Poseidon's names, Epacteus, means God worshipped on the coast. The sea god was known as Poseidon to the Greeks and Neptune to the Romans. Poseidon's trident was viewed as three-pronged because the sea is said to be a third part of the world. Poseidon was associated with the waters and its creatures, dolphins, horses, and especially his trident weapon, crafted by the Cyclops under the supervision of Vulcan. As the thunderbolt symbolized Zeus, the trident symbolized the sea god, also called the god of horses. Myths of Poseidon tell of him fathering many horses, including the winged horse Pegasus. Poseidon is said to have introduced the first horses to the Greeks. The hippocamp, or seahorse, would be a natural combination of the god of both the sea and the horse. Poseidon is often shown riding a chariot pulled by sea horses. Poseidon was the father of Agenor, the first king of Tyre, an ancient Phoenician city. The Phoenician historian Sancho Nyothon concluded that the gods they worshipped were deified ancestors with special accomplishments to whom cosmic elements had been applied, or celestial bodies like the sun, moon, and stars. Sancho Nyothon noted that Poseidon was the son of the sea god Nereus, which may have been another deified name of Canaan, who may also have been worshipped as the god Dagon. The book of Genesis records that Sidon was Canaan's firstborn son. Sanchunyathon calls Nereus' son Poseidon. The ancient port city of Sidon may have been named after him. Tyre, which had begun as a satellite city of Sidon, rose to become a large trading empire and one of the most important Phoenician cities. Around 1000 BC, King Hiram of Tyre built a temple to Melkart, the chief of their pantheon of gods. Melkart literally means king of the city, more a title of honor rather than a name. Some scholars view this god as a mysterious figure, but perhaps you can figure out who he really was. Melkart was linked to the kings of Tyre, the sea, colonization of coastal lands, and trade. Ancient coins from the city of Tyre may give us a clearer picture of his identity. Melkart on a winged seahorse over the waves of the water with a dolphin. A coin with a winged seahorse on the front and a sea god holding two dolphins by the tail. Another Phoenician coin from the first millennium BC has a kingly god with a trident weapon slung across his back and still another with a trident in hand. A trident weapon more clearly seen in this ancient Phoenician sculpture from Tyre showing Melkart battling a mythical creature. Phoenician maritime traders exchanged more than just material goods with the civilizations. Their deified ancestor Poseidon may have captured the imagination of the Greeks, Romans, and perhaps even the Celtic tribes with whom they traded. Ancient Celtic trident coins are found in hordes from the 3rd to the 1st century BC. A trident wielded by a warrior on horseback could be easily recognized by the Phoenicians with whom the Celts traded with. Trident coins reveal the symbolic importance of this ancient weapon to the Celtic tribes. In India and Southeast Asia, the trident is called the trishula, which means three spikes. Similarly, the trident simply means three teeth. The trident, like the trishula, is a short-handled weapon with three points, which may be attached to a staff. Although used by other Vedic gods, the trishula has become symbolic of the god Shiva, and is seen to represent his three activities of creation, preservation, and destruction. The trident bearing Shiva and Poseidon have important roles in the Ramayana and Dionysiaca epics that some scholars claim to be historical records of the same event. Comparison of the two poems, the Dionysus and the Ramayana, would prove Dionysus and Rama to have been the same person. A curious parallel may be drawn between the manners and customs described in these two works, the Dionysiaca and the Ramayana. 
The processions and rites detailed in the former seem descriptive, with a little license for poetical embellishment of those in usage to this day in India. A keen etymologist would find innumerable lingual coincidences. Both epics tell of a bloody prolonged war in India, fought on land and water. The hero Rama was commanded by the gods to fight against the demon king Ravana, while Dionysus was ordered by the gods to campaign against the impious Indian nation ruled by Deryades. Both heroes, Rama and Dionysus, were sons of a god with a mortal woman. In the Dionysiaca, it is the tribes of Europe, including the Celts, the Greeks, and the ancient Phoenician cities, that gathered as one to invade the Indian lands. It has been hypothesized that an early Aryan civilization, dominated by peoples with linguistic affinities to people in Iran and Europe, came to occupy northwestern and then north-central India over the period from roughly 2000 to 1500 BCE and subsequently spread southwestward and eastward at the expense of other indigenous groups. Many Hindus believe that Rama is based on an actual historical character, just as some scholars consider Dionysus to have been the first conqueror of India. There are literally hundreds of versions of the Ramayana epic embedded in the collective memories of the peoples of Asia and Southeast Asia. But why India? India was the gateway to the Golden Lands, the Orea Chersonesus, and ultimately to Crise, the island of gold. Historian Josephus Flavius recorded a joint venture between King Solomon and King Hiram of Tyre to the land that was of old called Ophir, but now the Orea Chersonesus, which belongs to India, to fetch him gold. In the Philippines, claimed by some to have been the ancient land of Ophir, the Maranao have an epic poem, the Darangen, composed of 17 cycles and 72,000 lines, which includes their history, folk tales, laws, and social customs. A part of their epic contains what seems to be a localized version of the story of Rama and Sita. They even have a traditional dance, the Sinkil, which retells the story as dancers avoid being trapped by the click-clacking bamboo poles. Maharadya Lawana is a prose version of the Ramayana. The tale is a well-loved story known throughout the Lake Lanao region. Unlike the classical Darangen, poetry of the Maharadya Lawana is more popular with the masses who enjoy the retelling even in informal gatherings. With several versions of the Ramayana Dionysiaca tale, as well as a traditional dance to immortalize the events that may have taken place thousands of years past, the Maranao communities seem to be preserving a story belonging to them and not a story imported from somewhere else. It is in the western volcanic highlands that surround Lake Lanao, the largest freshwater lake of Mindanao, where tombs have been found with pottery and bronze artifacts seemingly of ancient European origin. Some of the bronze grave goods were featured in the video ancient Greek armor in the Philippines. Bronze weapons were uncovered, including an amazingly crafted trident. The sophisticated weapon could have easily been wielded by gripping the handle or by attaching it to a staff, making it effective in close combat or distant fighting. The three edges are made of dagger-like points. The shape of the two outer blades resembles the pre-Iberian falcata, an inward curving single-edged blade capable of a powerful axe-like blow with a slashing and stabbing capability of a sword. Single-edged near the hilt and double-edged near the point, the weapon was weighted toward the tip, which allowed it to slash or stab its way through armor with relative ease. The two outer blades have hook-shaped hilts decorated with elephants, stylized vines, and geometric patterns that attach to the main body of the trident. Armored elephants were an important part of warfare in ancient times. All three blades have a fuller or canalure, a rounded groove along the flat side of the blade which allows a reduced central weight in the thickest area of the spine without sacrificing strength. The ridges caused by the blacksmith making the grooves serve to increase the strength of the blade as thicker areas are created. 
The central leaf-shaped double-edged blade of the trident has two decorative curved slots along the fuller that would serve to considerably lighten the blade while relying on the strength of the thicker section to support its structure. Unlike most Bronze Age double-edged blades that were only effective for stabbing, the Celtic leaf-shaped blade was also an effective slicing tool. The ability to stab with dagger-like point and cut quickly with its curving blade allowed the warrior to kill more easily. An innovation in blade technology giving the fighter a real advantage in the battlefield. The leaf-shaped blades were so effective that they were soon adapted by the Bronze Age Greeks. The hilt of the middle blade is a straight form embellished with stylized floral and geometric motifs that connect directly to the main handle. The design may have served to reinforce the hollow handle, as it is sturdy enough to use with or without a staff inserted into it. Four impish heads with curling locks peek out from the main handle in marvelous miniature craftsmanship, while two creatures resting on the spaces between the three blades transform from resting birds to grinning horned heads. Sophisticated miniature masterpieces, disembodied heads, and a fascination with transformation were traits of Celtic art. The Phoenicians claimed Poseidon was a real man, father of the first king of Tyre. His trident was said to have been passed on to his son, Triton. Triton has come to represent mermen, half man, half fish, possibly symbolizing descendants who had chosen to live the maritime life. Could one of his descendants have chosen to live in the cool highland climate of abundant lands in the eternal spring of the Philippines? Thank you for joining us in opening the book of our past in the hopes of a brighter future.